Hi, everybody. I'm Carl Binder, CEO of the Performance Thinking Network, and this is a redo. We did this webinar yesterday. We had a bunch of people who attended, but uh, for the first time in 38 months, our webinar platform, Webinar Jam, did not send us a recording even after some messages to their support team. So I'm going to redo it. I think I might be able to make it better. Uh, and I want to explain a little bit about this one because um, I got interesting feedback yesterday. One person, a longtime performance improvement colleague, said he thought it might have been the most practical of these webinars that I've done in three years plus. Another colleague, again, long time, uh, said he didn't think there was much what's in it for me and uh, was not one of the best. So what I've learned and what I certainly understand is that these webinars are not, not all of them are for everybody. Uh, and there are different audiences we have in mind. And this one, the purpose of this one is several fold. One is uh, that I think box two in the six boxes model, which we'll be talking about, tools and resources is a highly underutilized category uh, in people finding and leveraging opportunities to improve performance. Sometimes fixing, improving, or enhancing things in the category of tools and resources can, can very inexpensively make a big difference in people's performance. Secondly, um, this truly traces back to the natural science of behavior, to, to B.F. Skinner, who was my professor at Harvard uh, lifetimes ago. Uh, and, and I wanted to show that a little bit, partly because some of you are interested in behavior science and the origins of behavior science and what the pathway was from it to what we do now in performance thinking. And also because we have an increasing uh, audience in the applied behavior science, applied behavior analysis uh, world, and I thought they might be interested as well. So uh, this is a little bit because I want to do it, but I'm hoping you will find it interesting. Let's go to the slides. As the title says, oops, I'm definitely a box two guy. That is, even when I, uh, when I look around my house or my office, I realize that I'm always captured by whatever the coolest new tools are. And I'm often looking for improved ones. And I'm often looking for ones that are elegantly designed to fit the need, whatever it might be. Um, but also, as I say, I'm a performance consultant, and I've been doing this work for almost 50 years. And what I've noticed is that by not taking into account explicitly in broad contexts the power of tools and resources, that we miss some opportunities. Now, uh, for those of most of you know, you'll be watching this on YouTube, I suspect, but we have a whole lot of webinars on YouTube at our performancethinking.tv URL, which takes you straight to our YouTube channel. Uh, we also, over the last year, uh, and we've done this in fits and starts, but we're creating simple one-page study guides for some of these webinars because they're topics that colleagues, graduate students, people forming reading clubs, uh, you know, and places like ATD chapters and so forth, uh, find interesting. And so we thought we would give people a little uh, set of questions and topics to talk about or think about uh, as they watch or perhaps after they watch some of these. And if you want to get on the list for free, you know, delivery of those as we do new ones, use this QR code and it'll take you there. We promise not to spam you. We'll send you uh, updates about new study guides. And also we're excited, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, the application kits that we're planning to launch later this year. Very, very low cost tool sets for very specific performance thinking applications. Now, of course, if you're watching on YouTube, I'd certainly appreciate it. We'd appreciate it here if you would like and share this for your, with your colleagues, uh, because that gets the word around. And we find lots of people, more and more from all over the world, who are finding these resources useful. We've got more webinars coming. This is just a short list. The first one is really about expanding when we think about consequences for behavior, motivating consequences beyond just tangible things or financial rewards. We're thinking about a much broader range of enabling people to make contact with the natural consequences of their successful work. We're talking about a whole bunch of things that are not just about you know, gift cards and uh, financial incentives. Uh, sales enablement, we're gonna take a, another run at uh, in, in, in the next few months, because what we recognize still is that those of our colleagues and friends in sales training and sales enablement 
still don't fully understand that if you define the milestones or what salespeople would call the advances, fine-grained in a successful sales process, you can train, coach, and support that performance much more easily than just about any other way. We want to talk about, I call it upside potential. Tom Gilbert called it potential for improving performance in the context of exemplary performance. Sometimes there's individuals who are exceptional in their performance, and we want to find out what their secrets are. Sometimes they don't even know what they're doing that allows them to be more productive. And so I want to talk about that, share a few examples. Uh, we have colleagues, uh, Paul Elliott, Al Folsom, uh, and their colleagues uh, who have been sort of leveraging exemplary performance analysis for a long time. And we always suggest that people, as I say, put a dash of exemplary performance analysis in any project they do if there are exceptional performers. So we want to talk about that. And then we want to talk about change management from a, a, a performance thinking perspective. And what we notice is when we look out there at the various change management methodologies, um, you know, there's people who are real good at communication plans. They know how to line up their champions. They find change agents. And then they have this vague bucket called reinforcement. And we want to use performance thinking, focus on valuable contributions or outputs or accomplishments, and the six boxes model as a framework for not just supporting the development of new performance, but sustaining it over time. Because we think we have some additional values there. And there's a bunch of other topics too, but those are some of them that will be coming up. Next month, we're really, I'm really excited. I'm going to be partnering with Therese Longo, who's a, been a colleague now for some years. And Therese, who went through our practitioner program some years ago and already came uh, locked and loaded for performance improvement because of some of uh, our mutual colleagues that she'd been talking about for a few years, I think. She has, she has basically helped to transform her training and development company, where she's vice president of operations, from a fairly traditional training and documentation provider to being more and more of a performance consultant and consulting organization. And so one of the things that they have glommed onto and really run with is something we've been working with different folks with for probably 15 years, which are accomplishment-based job profiles or performance expectation tools or enhanced uh, job descriptions but ones that focus on the outputs or the accomplishments that define a job. And what she's seen, as we've seen in other contexts over the years, is a lot of advantages to that with her clients. And so we, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna kind of provide a little bit of an overview, and then we're gonna have a discussion about uh, how this has all evolved, what their work and their kind of applications have looked like as they continue to refine them, and some of the broader, uh, broader implications of having accomplishment-based job profiles for ongoing accomplishment-based talent development. So we're really excited about that. Please, please sign up. Um, our agenda today is, want to do the usual, except it'll be brief, overview of our performance thinking models and tools and how, how those relate to what we're going to talk about. And then I want to zero in on box two and talk a lot about how tools and resources as a category of behavior influence really can be traced back to the very beginnings of, of B.F. Skinner's, uh, you know, basic behavior research laboratory at Harvard back in the 30s came up through the field of uh, behavior science and through Tom Gilbert and then with our work has, has blossomed into a whole thing. So there's a tradition there that I want to lay out just so you understand where things came from. And then I've got a lot of examples just to throw out and I'm sure you have zillions yourself, but different kinds of examples of tools and resources. And some of the reasons that I always want to be sure we take into account box two when we're looking, when we're doing analysis and design for performance. And then we hope we have some dis discussions and, uh, and questions, perhaps in the uh, below the YouTube, uh, you know, on the YouTube post. It all starts out with Tom Gilbert, at least in this context. Now, it doesn't really because it goes back to B.F. Skinner, with whom he was a postdoc for a while. But this book is really, in many ways, what set me on my way back in the early 80s uh, in performance improvement. And this book was published in 1978, and it's still taught in graduate schools. And we, it's been uh, through several editions of updated versions, essentially the same thing, but with testimonials and, and forewords and stuff like that. Several years ago, at the 40th anniversary, we celebrated it at the International Society for Performance Improvement, as well as at the Association for Behavior Analysis International. Tom's 
ghost co-author, his late wife, Marilyn, was with us then. And uh, it's still out there. And in this book, Tom provided a whole bunch of brilliant insights and sort of philosophy of performance improvement. But one of the most important things was he said, in the great cult of behavior, and by that he didn't mean behaviorists or whatever, he meant all of us, managers, trainers, uh, leaders, um, instructional designers, we all look at activity or behavior. And he says, in the great cult of behavior, behavior itself is viewed as an end rather than as a means to an end. That's what we do our objectives so often with. But then he says, we must enable people to produce accomplishments, the valuable products of behavior. Now, this changed the world for those who listened, because what it meant was we'd be focusing on the valuable contributions of people, not the costly behavior that they use to produce them. And we call those accomplishments work outputs. And there's a whole long story about that. But the core of it is that um, the word accomplishments is a great word. And a lot of our colleagues have used it over certainly since they heard about it and started seeing how Tom Gilbert talked about it and Joe Harless, who was his protege. But what we've seen out in the literature and in presentations and in talking with colleagues over several decades is that people use that word in a lot of different ways. And some of them use it as though it were the completion of something, the completion of behavior. And they don't specify the product explicitly sometimes, like the completion of the procedure. Some of them talk about it as though it were high in business results. Some people talk about it in very small ways. We coined the phrase work outputs, so we don't want to argue with how people use the word accomplishments. But what we're seeking in our analysis and what people produce are things that are product of behavior or work, you could say, in the work context. And they can be plural. That is, they're countable things. Now, they might be tangible widgets and such, or they might be intangible things like decisions, but they're things. So that's where it all started. And we use our simple model, what we call the performance chain, to show how work outputs or accomplishments fit into the context of other things. So, uh, Behavior influences, which we'll be talking about today, affect, they influence behavior, either positively or negatively. And those, that behavior, if it's the right behavior, produces work outputs or accomplishments that meet criteria. And if they do, they're valuable because they contribute to business or organizational results. So that's the, that's the simple framework for how we analyze and define performance. Um, and Gilbert made a really important point, which I've sort of alluded to, but I think it's worth highlighting. He said that if we're intervening in performance, whether it's as a manager or leader, or whether it's as a trainer or a coach, whatever our intervention is, its worth is equal to the value of the accomplishments that it enables individuals, people, or processes to produce uh, more of or better divided by the cost to produce that behavior. And if you think about it, we can spend a lot of money trying to change behavior and training and taking people off the jobs and doing this and that and the other thing. Sometimes it doesn't necessarily produce a lot more or higher quality outputs. So this was a very important way to think about why we focus on accomplishments and what we mean by valuable accomplishments. And in current day terms, it's really about return on investment. Now, today, we're going to shift and talk about behavior influences because those are all of the things that influence either positively or negatively behavior to produce work outputs to contribute to organizational results. And if you go back to B.F. Skinner in basic science about what drives or what influences behavior, he had this simple framework. It's a little bit nerdy because of, the, because of the letters, but what they are is discriminative stimuli, SDs, set the occasion for responses that hopefully lead to reinforcing stimuli. Maybe con punishing ones too, but at least in the ideal world, reinforcing. Now, Aubrey Daniels and some other applied people talked about antecedents, behavior, and consequences. Og Lindsley was another one. Uh, but um, this is the basic framework. And so behavior analysts, um, organizational behavior management folks, a lot of our colleagues either explicitly or implicitly think about behavior as being driven by, you know, increased by its consequences or maybe decreased and being occasioned by discriminative stimuli or antecedents. And that's great. And it worked 
extremely well in the laboratory and it works extremely well in simple cases because what you recognize is that in the lab we assume that all of the individuals whether they're rats pigeons dogs monkeys or people are in an environment and working in a setting that's standard and they're kind of all the same but the reality is uh individuals are not all the same, we humans, especially in the world of work. And so Tom Gilbert, who was a student of Skinner, basically, he turned that into what he called the behavior engineering model. And this is the thing that not everybody gets, but that those three columns in the behavior engineering model line up with Skinner's three components, uh, you know, antecedents, behavior, and consequences. And so the first column in, in uh, Tom's world was information needed to perform. And then the second column was whatever does that enabled responding or behavior. And then the third, when you're actually doing it. And then the third one was what are, what's, what's motivation. But what Tom recognized was that we're all different. We differ as individuals. We differ sometimes by company cultures or by ethnic cultures or by all kinds of different differences. And so we need to separate out the variables that occur in the environment, which management and the organization control, and those in the person, which we can help develop, but which are individual. And so what, so what he said was, with respect to information, there's data that the environment gives us to help us know what we're trying to achieve, how we're doing, etc. And then there's knowledge, which he thought of as information that we carry around. And then with respect to responding, there are the instruments, he called them, the actual environment, the, you know, the tools, resources, uh, people, human resources, et cetera, all the things that enable us to respond as we are performing. And then there's our capacity as individuals. Are we a good fit for this job? Are we strong enough to be a doc worker? Are we analytical enough? Do we have the right training? Do we align with the values of this organization, et cetera? So that's what capacity is about. It's about the individual matching them up to this, whatever the requirement is. And then the third consequence is incentives, of course. What are the positive or perhaps negative, but incentives described here, usually thought of as positive. But the thing is, it's possible, as Skinner knew, that a given event might not accelerate some individual's behavior. And so motives was Tom Gilbert's way of taking that into account, which, yeah, well, we can arrange, you know, you get to go to Hawaii with the president if uh, you meet a certain number, but what if you hate Hawaii? It's probably not gonna work for you. You'd maybe rather have a gift card to Amazon. So the point is that those two things also go together. This was Tom's model. And I encountered it in about 1981 or 82 when another of my colleagues gave me Tom's book to read. And I was working with sales uh, development folks and we were getting people to do practice to build fluent sales knowledge on their own, new salespeople. And the, the challenge was we could help them develop knowledge, fluent knowledge with the tools and the materials we had. But in order to get them to practice, in order to have them apply what they were learning on the job, we had to look at those other variables. So we got real excited about this. I and my slightly nerdy performance improvement colleagues. But and a lot of, you know, millions of, or at least thousands and thousands of performance oriented professionals have used this model. But when we started to share it with our clients, uh, it kind of was like this. And the whole point of sharing these models, because we'd really, you know, we wanted to partic we wanted to partner with our clients. The whole idea of sharing was communication and engagement, because in the end, they're the people who are going to control at least the top row of that model. And we wanted to be able to communicate with them. But when we would present it to people, you know, they say instruments, like, what is that again? It sounds like a guitar, but it's probably not. Is that like an ohmmeter or a, what is that? Or data, what kind of data? Is that spreadsheets or what is that? Et cetera. So the words themselves, people had a hard time with. And what we found was they made a lot of category errors. It was harder to learn and share the language and be clear about it. So I spent probably about five years between the early to mid 80s and the end of the 80s, tweaking the language. And a lot of our colleagues did. Harold Stolovich did, uh, uh, Roger Chevalier did. They had their versions as well. And, but we, we revised and revised and we user tested. And the way we user tested was to see if we could introduce this in 10 or 15 minutes to people and kind of explain a little bit about it and then see what would happen. And I can tell you on many, many occasions, I would take 
informally really a few minutes with somebody with the back of an envelope or a napkin or their whiteboard and i'd draw out this and i'd label it and talk to them a little bit about it and they'd sort of seem to get it and i'd, and I'd come back weeks later and they were actually using it in an effective way maybe not powerfully but at least they were leveraging this thing and so we knew we had it and so that's the model that we have been using ever since about 1990 or 88 and Tom Hogan, who was a client, a very wise vice president of sales training at Dan Bradstreet, actually named it in, a, in the mid-90s. Because I was always referring back to Gilbert's model, but it's obviously different in some language-wise. And so Tom said, you're all, Tom Hogan said, you're always talking about those boxes. Why don't you just call it the six boxes? So we did. And we eventually trademarked it. And it's a specific user-tested thing. So just to get the overview, most of you know about it. But... Box one is expectations and feedback, all the information that, and it, from all levels that enables us to know what we're supposed to do and produce and how we're doing. And there's a lot of that. Tools and resources is what I'm going to talk about today. We'll drill into that more. But those are all the things that enable us to perform as we are doing it. They're not things that happen in the past or the future. They're the enablers as we, they're everything from the human resources we might need to, to uh, the right sef talk technology to having access to reference materials, et cetera. Box three is all the things that happen, either intentionally or unintentionally, that either increase the chances that people will keep doing this or maybe decrease them. Um, and then the bottom row in the individual, individuals need skills and knowledge to perform, uh, and organizations often help them achieve those. Or they come in and are selected for those. But it's not as big a box as everybody seems to think in terms of its leverage, because the other stuff's got to be in place if that really is going to work. And then box five are all of the things that we select people for jobs, for tasks, for projects, for even companies, uh, based on their capabilities, their personalities, their values. And that's we retain Tom's word capacity, but it's about selecting and assigning people, fitting them to the to the jobs and tasks we expect. And then finally, motives and preferences include everything from the individual, what they care about, their purpose, to also the, are they aligned with the organization's purpose, are there cultural values, et cetera. So there's a lot in there. And the residual effect in box six that we talk about when we discuss employee engagement is that when the first five boxes are working well, the net of that is people are pretty happy and their attitude is positive. But if the first five are all messed up and disconnected and conflicting, then we'll get a bad attitude. But that's not our topic today. One of the things, and I don't make that big a deal of this, but uh, a colleague of ours several years ago at the International Society for Performance Improvement uh, had a session that I didn't know about in advance, but he... Uh, they sort of nominated and voted on performance models. And the six boxes model got voted the best performance model in the world. This is his slide. And um, it was not a big number of people. And so we don't make that big of a deal of it. But I think it's because it's been around, it's memorable, and it's usable that people like it. So if it's not completely obvious, we use the six boxes to organize and make sense of the system of influences that affect behavior. Now, we're going to focus on box two today, uh, the highly, I think, underutilized cell in this model. And we're going to go way back to the pigeon lab, to Skinner's pigeon lab. Um, you know, he, uh, in, in, in Skinner's operant conditioning chamber, he didn't like the word Skinner box. Um, it looked like this. And first of all, you see a whole bunch of apparatus there. So it's all tools and resources for the experimenter. But for the pigeon, there's a couple things of note. First of all, this is truly accomplishment-based. As uh, Og Linsley pointed out to me many years ago, it's really not the key peck that matters here. The, 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 the pigeon is pecking the little round key in front of him, which, is, which will uh, close the micro switch if, it's, if, the, if the peck is at the right place and with the right intensity. But as my colleague pointed out, the closure of the micro switch is the accomplishment. That's what's important because that's what gets you food. So the front end of the pigeon moving is not really what we all we care about. We care about it moving sufficiently to close the micro switch so that you get food. So that's one part of it. But more importantly, that switch, that little key that's in front of the pigeon's face um, is designed for the pigeon. 
It's made so pigeons won't hurt their beak, so they can do it a lot for a long time. It's ergonomically designed for pigeons. And that's how the early operant conditioners, starting, you know, Skinner created this whole science, basically from the, his doctoral work and postdoctoral work at Harvard in the 30s. They, when they tr came to a new organism, they would define and refine ergonomically the interface. We would call it kind of the user interface, but the manipulandum, the tool that that organism would use. And um, uh, here's an example for human uh, laboratory work. The left, left two are not built to support long-term easeful, uh, you know, resistance to fatigue performance. But the one on the right is because it's designed like this. And Ogden Lindsley, who started the first full-on human operant conditioning lab with B.F. Skinner called Behavior Research Lab in the 50s, designed this manipulandum, this tool. And it's a plunger that can either be pushed or pulled, depending on a setting. And you can use it for hours on end if you want to without being tired. It was refined to the point, was easy to use, much like the key, the, the key for the pigeon and the lever for the rat. And this is what it looked like in a laboratory room uh, where uh, adults were exposed to different kinds of uh, relationships with consequences and antecedents. You can see to the right of the man's head two sort of dots, and those are handles on two different Lindsley operanda or manipulanda. Above them are two little panels that have lights that could be in different colors. And then to the right is the reinforcement dispenser where tokens, money, cigarettes, candy, etc. could be arranged to come out. Now, this is a joke in a way, but uh, we have a job aid here for this rat. How to eat. Face the lever, reach for it, press to click, and eat food. Trouble is the rat can't read. And so another aspect of tools and resources, including job aids, is that they need to be built for the performer. And ideally, they need to be user tested to be sure they work. And I'm going to come back to that later. But a lot of people produce documents and procedure documents and policy documents, and they don't really test them with users, and they're not usable. I can tell you some large companies I've worked with, big-time companies, where people are trying to work with policy documents and procedure documents that are really hard to use, ambiguous, not understood very well, and it's because they weren't designed and refined based on user testing. Now, here's some data from a long time ago, a previous lifetime, 1977, when I was running for 10 years a research laboratory uh, in, the, uh, in, a, in the, one of the basements of a back unit at a state institution for people that were then medically described as severely and profoundly retarded. That is not okay language these days, but that's the language that doctors and psychologists and parents and everybody used then. And you don't have to look at this in detail, but we were teaching these residents of this institution who'd been there mostly their whole lives, simple sight reading vocabulary because they'd never been taught to read and nobody ever thought they could learn to read. And we were teaching them words that they might see on signs or directions one word at a time with sight reading because we didn't think we could teach them a full repertoire of reading. And what you can see there without getting too far into it is with each set of three words that we were teaching to be sure they could discriminate and then say, we do three at a time, and when the dots were all up to the top, the black dots, that meant they were basically completely accurate or they had been two or three out of days in a row, and we could move on. Well, what you see, what's most important here, is that was a teacher-controlled procedure. And the fastest you could present those trials was about 10 or 12 a minute. And when we changed simply to worksheets, to arrays of these words that we could, the student could point to a name at their own pace, without any other intervention, it doubled. It went from about 12 a minute to about 24 a minute. And then if you look at subsequent charts, you'd see that it accelerated. So there was a big learning here for me back in those days, which was that how we teach can often constrain learning because it slows down the learner. It does not give them as many reps or opportunities. And so this is la old laboratory data, but it's relevant to tools and resources because even our instructional procedures and materials, our online things that move too quickly and so forth, can, can push back on performance. Now, of course, we have 
lots of tools and resources. So if we expand this concept and start up thinking of it in real life, this is just a few snapshots around my home. You know, this is my uh, EV in the in the foreground. Oops, in the foreground there, which is a new kind of tool and is oops, excuse me, and is you know saving me money and saving the environment. And we humans have created it. Then in the background, you can see my 1997 van that my three children all learned to drive in, and they're in their 30s now or close to it. And then we have my Prius, which I've had for many, many years, which was a movement toward a EV. It was a hybrid. So there's all that. And then there's tools I use for chopping wood, for working in the garden, different kinds of flashlights for different purposes. And so on. You all have countless tools and resources. And if you begin to think about it, you recognize that if you, especially if you like tools, like if you look at the far right, you'll see two act two log splitters. Well, the one that's black, the handle is black and yellow, is a really sharp, heavy, good splitter. The other one's kind of old, but it's a sledgehammer, essentially, if I turn it around. So I can take that first one, I can I can get it in a log, and then I can use the other one and pound on it. And it's a beautiful combination of splitting so that I leverage the old sort of beat up tool with the newer one and it's quite efficient. So that's just an example and we've all been there, I think. Think about the kitchen. It depends on whether you like to cook or not or whether your partner does or whatever, but where would we be without tools for preparing food? A lot of archeological you know, studies go back to you know, 15,000 years ago and they discovered pottery or cooking implements or you know, stone knives. Think about their whole stores, their whole companies devoted to food preparation tools and resources, and some are better than others. Now, if we step back and, re and go back to the six boxes model, it's important to notice that tools and resources are in the context of a system and that every cell in this model is related to every other cell potentially. So, for example, expectations and feedback better be aligned with consequences because as my old friend Aubrey Daniels used to say, if you ask somebody to do something, they do it, nothing happens, they might not be doing it so much anymore. Or if you set expectations and say, I don't want you to do that, and then there's no consequence, people will ignore it. Expectations and feedback, if used effectively by a coach or a supervisor, can enable people to gain skills and knowledge without having to leave and be, you know, go into formal training and so forth. And similarly, uh, we can, uh, we can develop skills and knowledge for delivering expectations and feedback. Um, uh, tools and resources are related to everything, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But, you know, for example, a box two and box three, if we have a bad tool, it can be unintended consequences. The point is every single one of these factors works with every other one. And our ideal for return on investment is to optimize how those work together, how positive they are, and how cost effective they are. But focusing on box two, we can talk about the ways in which tools and resources are related to everything else. So for example, a classic kind of tool that we'll be talking about later is job aids or good documentation. A good job aid can also set expectations and can even be a tool used while giving feedback. It can also, if you use a good job aid or online help system or a similar thing as a tool and you use it repeatedly, that can help you develop skills and knowledge. Conversely, um, we need to set expectations for people to use new tools and not only, and provide feedback when they do it as desired, you know, when they're doing it correctly, so to speak. And similarly, some tools, software and so forth, require us to develop skills and knowledge in order to use them efficiently. Tools, if they're good ones, can have enormous positive consequences. We can chop more logs in a shorter time. We can do a better job at diagnosing software problems. We can do whatever it is, better, quicker, cheaper, faster, whatever, with the right tools and resources. But as everyone knows, if we have bad tools and resources or processes or inaccessible uh, you know, documentation, et cetera, there can be unintended negative consequences. I know I seem to be struggling with technology every day as new security systems and new features come up that I didn't really need. Um, tools and resources, uh, we need to select people who know how to use them sometimes. And similarly, some people don't really like certain tools and resources. I mean, a simple, simplistic example is, I don't really like user interfaces that are all based on icons unless there's only a few of them. I'd much rather have the words on there too. And so most of the apps that I use have both. 
and then motives and preferences of course we do have our preferences so all the all box, box two is linked to everything is the only point now we know this is a job aid that we use in our programs we know what we've tried to do here in each cell of the model is to is to sort of in the shortest number of bullets summarize the different kinds of things we ought to put in place if we want to support a behavior and tools and resources you'll see that's what those are all the kinds of things that are needed um, but of course as i mentioned before some tools don't work so well this is a kitchen tool uh, which apparently is for shredding beef and it's probably marketed well on the internet at some point but it's not that good according to reports and for that reason we have a, a, a reflect we have a other side of the job aid which has all the things that can go wrong in box two you can have insufficient people money time supplies tools or other resources you can have managers that aren't present they're bean counters and sit in their office you can have poorly designed job aids that are workflow we can have lack of the people we need we can have bad ergonomic bad ergonomics bad reference etc so there's a lot of things that can go wrong in box two also now this is one of my favorite examples this is an example of the information mapping method. And if you don't know about the information mapping of method of structured uh, structured writing, you ought to learn about it. There's a company called the Information in, Information Mapping Inc. And it was actually founded by an old friend of mine who was in his 90s now, Robert Horn, who did the research in the in the 60s and early 70s to develop information mapping. And it really was the first well-defined methodology for what's called structured writing. Um, and I know Bob well, and I know about the history. Bob brought together during his research and development years principles from programmed instruction, from readability, from ergonomics, from the use of graphics and words, from a whole lot of different fields to create a methodology that can be taught and learned. And many, many companies have trained their people to create documentation, training materials, et cetera, using the information mapping method. This is something that's probably 40 years old, at least. It's called the Jack Spotter exercise. And these are two versions of the same memo. And if I were to ask you, what's Jack Spotter's new job? On the left one, you'd be reading down the first paragraph and then the second paragraph and then the third paragraph. Oh, and then you say, oh, wait a minute here. Jack Spotter will be the new head of research department moving from his position as assistant vice president of operations. So I don't know how long that took me, but we could have timed me. On the right one, if you said, what's Jack Spotter's new job? I go, Oof down to the table. Oh, there's Jack Spotter. He'll move from assistant VP of operations to director of research. Now that is a simple example of how redesigning a reference tool for quick, easy, airless access can make an enormous difference. And I built a whole company, Product Knowledge Systems, around practice for fluency and sales reference documentation for easy and quick access. And it made a big difference. Here's an example of some, of, again, some of my own work that you might find interesting. Uh, I spent a number of years working, consulting to uh, customer call centers at AT&T Wireless, at Amazon.com, at Aurora Healthcare, some other places. And what we were doing is we were teaching people to sort of revolutionize their training by turning training into what we called fluency build instruction. So it was fluency based instruction rather where people would once they learn some basics they would then have very short timed practice activities uh, to get good at things to get so the knowledge that the, their responses to questions was comfortable and easeful and automatic and quick they didn't have to think about it so that their uh, ability to find the right information was online was you know easeful and it didn't get in the way of other things and one of the things we learned there, and, and so just to jump forward here, that's an article that you can get uh, on our website in the resource library under publications, Building Fluent Performance in a Customer Call Center. And Lee Sweeney, my co-author, was uh, was the, the um, call center manager, uh, basically director uh, at ATT Wireless at the time. But the data on the right are calls per hour handled by customer service representatives. And the, the open squares, are the number of calls per hour over the first couple, few weeks on the job that the traditionally trained people had. Not only did they start out at some number and slowly decelerate, but they certainly didn't reach the benchmark easily. 
On the other hand, the black dots are the people that we trained with this fluency-based practice focus. And they uh, were able to reach the benchmark in two weeks instead of two months, which is what it had traditionally taken people. And then they surpassed it by about 60%. So this was an extremely efficient, rapid acceleration of performance that dramatically reduced the cost of bringing people online. Um, this caught people's attention, as you can imagine. But one of the things that's embedded in this is that if you watch, and probably many of you have been involved in customer service types of training, if you watch customer service representatives, they often have to use several different online systems that have different interfaces, different information for different purposes, sometimes quite a few. And um, what we've noticed in the first several months of, 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 of new customer service reps is that finding information while somebody is asking you questions, maybe even yelling in your ear, using information, asking, accessing those systems is probably the biggest constraint on their acceleration toward benchmark productivity. And we provided exercises to these people during training, which would be things like, here's 30 things to find in the system. What's Mary Jo's account number? You know, what's the date that John Smith started uh, service with us, blah, blah, blah. And we would put two people together and we'd give them like three minutes and we'd say, how many can you find? And we, and we would do the same thing for entering information so that all the components of using all the systems became as one of our trainees, I remember saying, says, I do this stuff in my sleep now. But the point is by getting people fluent using the tools, we were able to reduce the ceilings or the constraints so that they could be very comfortable in talking with and addressing the needs of their customers. Now, if you stand back from this general notion of having good tools or tools that people are fluent with or not so good tools, you can think about it as also related to processes. So when you have tools that just are not so good, processes, systems, first of all, they'll probably increase labor costs because they will not be very time efficient. Secondly, they may well increase materials costs if you're a manufacturing environment or if you're a space in which people are using bad tools. They might increase overhead for a whole bunch of reasons. Again, they slow stuff down, backlog of processes, et cetera. They may result in reduced customer satisfaction. For example, if we don't have good tools while we're serving customers as customer service reps, we might wing it. And when we wing it, we might be wrong or we might hesitate or we might keep customer, customers online longer than, I, I, I uh, contacted a call center a few days ago for what seemed like a very simple uh, problem and they had to escalate it and I'm still waiting for a response. So, you know, those people are lacking some good policy documents, I think, and then, of course, you may have in the end reduced place on satisfaction. So there's a big potential consequences. This is uh, compliments at fastercapital.com. Um, and then this is one of the common problems. I, I suspect almost everybody's seen this one way or the other, or maybe been one of these people, where there's a system or a process that just doesn't work very well. It gets in your way. It's hard to use. Maybe it introduces errors. Maybe you have to go around in circles to get someplace. Maybe the user interface sucks, whatever. And very often, smart people find ways to move, work around that. So, you know, that system really sucks. Let me show you my workaround. Well, there's a, a real example from one of our clients years ago, big biotech firm who had, been, who had invested a ton of money in software to implement in their research and development centers um, uh, uh, computer-based note-taking for the scientists and researchers rather than paper-based. It was a big transition. So now everybody in all the centers around the world could look at the data and could be kept secure and all the rest of it. So they implemented a whole performance improvement change management thing designed to make that happen. And as they do at this particular company, they followed up six or eight weeks later to just do a quick ch check, a quick and dirty, is this working? And one of the things they found was that some people said, oh, I tried that system, but I didn't really like it. So I went back to writing notes. So, so what I love about that is for whatever reason, either the system itself or insufficient practice using it, it was, it was effortful or problematic compared to the old way. And they were useful using their notes. So you probably had to both eliminate pen pencils and papers in the lab and somehow or other make it easier to use that system because otherwise people wind up doing workarounds and sometimes those workarounds 
have ramifications for things like quality or, or um, regulatory compliance, record keeping, and so forth. Now, now Joe Harless, who was a friend and mentor of mine, oops, for some years, uh, he was a master of job aids. And he had, I think, in some ways, his most powerful workshop, job, the Job Aids Workshop, uh, fondly known as JAWS, that he delivered for years and enabled other people, including me, to deliver. But one of his famous statements that he said in different ways for years was, inside every fat course, there's a thin job aid crying to get out. And what he meant by that, he was pointing to something he once used as a joke. He, I've told this to many people, but Joe occasionally would talk about training in drag. This was, you've got to realize, this is a long time. It was like probably 20 years ago that I'm remembering this from. But what he meant was this. He said, your stakeholder comes to you and says, we need training. And without saying, no, you probably don't, he says, okay, can we take a look around? And so they look around, they do some analysis, and they realize it's really not a training problem, but you could solve whatever the issue was in part by giving people a good job aid, and that could get them up to speed cheaply, quickly, without taking people off the job, blah, blah, blah. But in order to satisfy the stakeholder, he would have a session of some kind where he'd introduce the job aid and be sure people know how to use it. So that was training and drag. It looked like training, but it was really just letting people use a job aid. And job aids are an enormously powerful way, just like information mapping, which is a methodology for creating good reference material, an enormously powerful way to save money, to get people up to speed quickly in situations where they actually can use job aids as long as they're accessible and usable. So it's a powerful box two intervention. And as I mentioned earlier, it can also set expectations for what people are need, supposed to do. Box one can provide a back a, a sort of a backgrounder for, let's say, a supervisor and an individual contributor providing feedback because you didn't do this step, for example. And it can develop people's skills without their having to be taken off the job. And then Joe, in his slightly more critical mode, to the left of there, the wisdom of the late Joe Harless, given us by Guy Wallace, uh, he, he said, I get confused when people say they're performance technologists, but always produce training or educational, informational type of interventions for every project. He was always annoyed that people just glommed on to box four, skills and knowledge, and assumed that we would all be order takers. Um, now, here's another tool. This is a kind of a process map, but it's almost like a, it is a process map, but it's also a use, it's a tool, because if you're trying to do usability to develop something to make it more usable, this is a pretty darn good sequence to go through. And a person, a manager or a project manager, or whatever, can probably use this to guide how they arrange the sequence of doing user testing and usability insurance. This is tools and resources at the highest possible level. Probably many of you know Gary Rumler's work. The late Gary Rumler was a, another mentor, not so much as some of the other folks, but he I learned a lot from Gary and he was a friend. And uh, as you may know, he and his colleague, uh, Alan Braish, kind of revolutionized things with the first edition of this book. Because what they talked about was the fact that the actual work, the value in organizations get delivered, not up and down the org chart, but across the org chart, across the white space on the org chart. And so he really helped jumpstart focus on process and also organizational relationship mapping altogether, all the different functions and departments in an organization and how they pass things around, how they basically pass accomplishments around, what they deliver to one another and in what context. And so he would work with whole organizations to optimize the organizational design from a performance perspective. Now that's tools and resources at a very high level, but that is what it is. It is environmental factors, the way things are organized and designed that enable performance to happen more easily for not just individuals, but processes, teams, and whole organizations. This is one of my favorites, the two pictures. On the left is a picture which some people think might be AI created, and I don't really care, but it's allegedly Steve Jobs, but next to the Volkswagen bus, he was kind of an ex-hippie, but the maybe an all-lifetime hippie, I don't know. But Steve sold his VW bus for $1,500 to help start Apple uh, 
computer. So he sort of sold one tool, this VW, to create another. But I think the right-hand part, which comes much later in his life, is very compelling. He says, what a computer is to me is the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with. It's the equivalent of a bicycle for our minds. And there's no doubt about that. And Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, by basically creating the first really packaged, easy to use personal computer for anybody, the Apple II, and then ultimately Macintosh, created, really started the revolution, which was then sort of cloned by Bill Gates, Microsoft and IBM, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this is what's come of all of that. And we all live with these tools and resources, the infinite number of applications, the incredible range of tools enhanced by telecommunications and the internet, enhanced by things like YouTube and audio and, and video conferencing. Imagine, imagine what our lives would be without this network of tools. So this is where we all live. And as you know, some of these tools can be magnificent, beautiful, and helpful. Other ones can get in the way and get you swearing at your computer because they are, they either have, you know, bugs that are considered a feature or whatever. And then this is a really important one. Box two also includes time. That is an important resource. And, you know, in many organizations, it's sort of not thought of as that way. In many organizations, it's thought of, well, you got a lot on your plate. I guess you're going to have to work on nights and e e you know, weekends for this one. But first of all, that's rather unfair to humans. And I actually think as we move into uh, younger leadership who have a different perspective on things, this is going to be changing some. But the statement on the left is one of the wisest things I've ever heard from a senior manager. Uh, stating explicitly he this was the first time we ever implemented our management program way back in the early 2000s and it was at a high-tech company and this guy was a senior director of uh, of a bunch of managers who were who were also in the class and so he was there but these other people were in this room and we were talking about six boxes and we were talking about box two and time and we were teaching people essentially to coach and develop their people so this was at the core of what this program was about and he said out loud to his managers, and he said, I, I also say this at other times, I expect you to, expect you to spend at least 10% of your time coaching the members of your team. In other words, there was a focus here on continuous development of people. And then he says, if you're having a hard time making the time, come to me and we'll adjust your priorities so you can devote enough time to developing your people. Now, this was a smart man because what he recognized was that management, at least in part, is the job of arranging conditions so that your people will be productive, engaged, and continuously developing. And that's what he was saying. And in order to do that, it can't just be a sideline. You might have to develop some time. So to me, an organization that, that gives people permission, in fact, encourages them to take time, whether it's for this kind of thing or as my son, who's a software developer, he works at a company, and they basically insist that people take time off, that they take time off on weekends. It's a new wise world in that regard. But the point is time is a resource, and we should think of it explicitly that way and take it into account. Now, even extending beyond sort of the business world, there's a couple of examples of sort of applications for we individual humans. And one of them was from my teacher, B.F. Skinner. Uh, I love this quotation from him, old age is rather like another country. Uh, you will enjoy it more if you prepared yourself before you go. And in, I think, the 80s, I don't remember when it was first published, maybe in the 90s, he, he co-authored a book with Maggie Vaughn called Enjoy Old Age. And by that time, Dr. Skinner was well into his eight, 70s and 80s. I forget exactly what year it was he did this. But he, as a gadgeteer himself, as an experimental psychologist, as a brilliant self-manager, was doing things like using watches that had larger hands to make up for visual loss, using, you know, I mean, obvious stuff like hearing aids and so forth. But he had a lot of very clever ways of taking notes, of reminders, of using pillboxes in certain ways, of arranging his environment to optimize his performance and his productivity that were adapting to his how he was aging. So this book is a real practical book. It's still out there, but it was about essentially tools and resources and routines for using them to optimize one's own performance. And then the article on the right is even older than this. This is from Ogden Lindsley, who was 
a protege of Skinner, a doctoral student who then with him started the first full operant conditioning lab for humans, the behavior research company at Harvard Medical School. And back in the 60s, after they'd been doing this work for some years, uh, Lindsley wrote this book called Geriatric Behavior Prosthetics, which sort of foreshadows the current era where people like me, we, uh, we baby boomers are becoming an increasingly large part of the population. We're a big part of the market now, of course. So you turn on television and the amount, the number of advertising that's for people over 65 is stunning. But what Lindsley was talking about then was prosthetics. Prosthetics are normally thought of as things like wooden legs and hearing aids, which is fair enough. But he was talking about arranging the environment. So as people's behavior starts to wane or they become weaker or whatever in old age, we can prosthetize, we can support their performance. And this article, which is on a, a website called fluency.org on the Lindsley page, uh, goes into sort of how you would do that analysis and so forth. So there's tools and resources out there for us to help ourselves with. And then this is one I must mention. Hank Pennypacker was one of my mentors and friends for almost 50 years, from about 1974 to last fall when he died. And um, he, among many, many other contributions, co-founded a company which later became a not-for-profit foundation called Mamacare. And they took on the project in the 70s and early 80s of figuring out how to solve the problem that at least thousands, if not tens of thousands of women were dying because they had breast cancer, but it was found too late. And that breast self-examination was not taught in a way that was really very sensitive. And frankly, not even a lot of medical professionals were very good at it. So what Penny Packer and his colleagues did is real basic science where they designed artificial breasts out of polymer material with little nodes inside of them and they refined them based on results until they were possible to use to practice detecting uh, bumps in the breast of, and they had versions different sizes and squishinesses and the whole thing uh, and what they were able to do is dramatically improve the size of lump that a person could detect when they did breast self-examination and this has saved arguably thousands of lives, maybe tens of thousands of lives since they developed it. So this is a tool, a very specific tool that enabled someone to practice something which is life-changing if they get good at it. And if you think about the medical devices world, there's a lot of, not quite the same as this, but there's an awful lot of tools and resources that get built. Like for example, I use a glucose continuous monitor app on my phone, not because I have diabetes, but because I'm very interested in the effects of my diet. It's a tool that I use for self-improvement. So that's kind of the range. And there's a lot more we could talk about here, but let me summarize some key points. The first thing is, um, you know, back in the basic research lab, we designed the environment the response mechanisms, et cetera, to optimize performance, that that was an early understanding that we need to use ergonomics, so-called, to design how we enable the experimental subject to respond so that it doesn't get in the way, so that it's easeful, so that they don't fatigue. So there's, a, there's an anchor back there in basic behavior science. And then we also learned, certainly in my work and a lot of other colleagues in those days, how procedures and materials we use to teach children, so-called discrete trials procedures and so forth, might be okay in the beginning, but they constrain the performance of the individuals so that very often the, the kids or the adults, whoever it was we were teaching, were never even able to get to competent performance. If you go back to the data example that I shared with you, where reading was being taught, presented materials about 12 a minute, Competent reading is over 150 words a minute. So you're never going to get there if your procedures will only allow 12 a minute. So you have to change them sometimes, including e-learning and so forth, to allow more opportunities to respond. Third one is, if we look explicitly at box two, if we don't think of it as just sort of something that's in the environment, but we say, wait a minute, can we improve the box, box two? Like, what tools do you use to do this? How are they working for you? Any suggestions for improvement? Have you found any workarounds? Those kinds of questions for our performers when we're interviewing and observing them can often produce dramatic 
improvements. Sometimes there's people that created a simple checklist, you know, that made a difference. Or, for example, you might know Atul Gawande's work um, uh, where we publish a book about how job aids essentially save lives in the operating room. Um, process improvement is an obvious example, because if you think about a lot of process improvement work, it's about redesigning workflow and often about eliminating waste by putting tools and resources closer, more accessible, more usable, um, et cetera. So process improvement is about building, is about improving tools and resources that are slightly larger chunk size in an organization, where it's how it all works together, not just sort of one thing at a time. And we can expand that because if we look at any performance environment, looking at systems and documents and how things are placed and how the job is even designed and all the things that go into the way we think about box two, tools and resources, there's enormous impact there. And often with some of them, uh, unless maybe it's software systems, there's very inexpensive potential changes we can make, a lot cheaper than training, a lot cheaper than some of the other components we might have used if we didn't improve the tools and resources. Um, the other thing is, and this is perhaps obvious, but there's a relation, strong relationship between box two and box three. That is, tools and resources can dramatically accelerate performance and make people happy campers at the end. So they're able to produce and have the natural positive consequences of their, of their performance and have people recognize it and have it all be good and have it be positive. And frankly, my emphasis when I think about box three in in, uh, consequences and incentives is I want to make all the other cells in the model optimized so people will make contact with the natural payoffs of doing well. But the flip side is that a bad process, an awkward tool, a lack of resources, a lack of time can lead to unintended punishing consequences, which can cause people to do workarounds, which might, might threaten things like safety or regulatory compliance, and may ultimately lead to less productivity. So there's big leverage in terms of consequences, in terms of how we select and refine our tools and resources. Another one, which may not be completely obvious, but you really need to practice using tools to enable fluent performance. So for example, in this call center environment that I mentioned, what we found was when we broke these systems down into this, the components they need to be good at, and we gave people a lot of practice for quite a few days in very short one to three minute intervals, they got really good at this stuff. And so then when they, we had them apply it in the context of handling calls, it was a piece of cake. And then the other example in the uh, in the lab uh, research lab uh, uh, change management example that I mentioned, uh, it's conceivable that if during the instructional process and in the first few weeks, the people who are in that R and D environment had been given a lot of practice so that these tools were simple and easeful and comfortable and they could do them in their sleep, maybe some people wouldn't have gone back to the old way. And so finally, I would like to summarize this. You know, box two is in the middle at the top, and that's somewhat coincidental. But I would say that in some respects, it's at the heart of any performance system. Because what we want to be sure is that all the connections between the tools and resources we make available that are needed for performance align with all the other variables. So that's basically what I have to say today. And I hope you find it useful or stimulating. Um, there's a few things to mention. Uh, one of them is that, of course, we have our open performance thinking practitioner program, which is a performance consulting certification program where we actually coach you through a real project in your environment. Um, and um, that's available a few times a year, and I teach it. And uh, the upcoming one, which is one of about three or four times a year we do it, is April 1st. We're pretty close to full right now. Uh, when and when, who knows when you'll be seeing this, but you can find uh, out about the program and you can uh, use that QR code to actually find the page that it's described on and it will have the current dates for the next upcoming group. We're going to actually put out the next date soon. Probably we'll have a group starting in June, but we're not sure yet. And then the other thing I mentioned at the beginning, but we're starting to create more of these free webinar study guides. So for some of our webinars, of which this is the 39th, we're pulling them out and either I or my new senior associate, um, Ian Patterson, are creating simple one pagers that are just meant to prompt either thoughtfulness if you're just watching it yourself and insights or in a group 
to prompt discussion and analysis and so forth. And if you want to get on the mailing list for those, you can use that QR code. We promise not to spam you. The mailing code is completely opt-in, and we have two things. We will send you updates when there are new study guides, and we'll also send you some updates about what we're excited about over the next year, which is we're going to develop these small application kits that I will mention to you in a moment right here, and it's the same mailing list. What we've learned uh, over the years is that you can take performance thinking in its full-on approach to analysis and engineering of performance, and you can pull out specific applications and template them so that people don't have to be complete, full-on performance analysts and designers to use them. So we can help you create employee engagement plans. We can help you do a better job managing your processes. We can enable people to develop and practice best leadership and management practices for both productivity and engagement, so forth. The list goes on. And we're now beginning to pilot uh, some of these uh, small chunks and the intention is to create some very inexpensive, like well under $100 kits that are digital that you can download and apply either yourself or if everybody in your team also gets them, you can apply in a group. So we're excited about that and we're not going to spam you, but we will let you know if you sign up in that mailing list uh, sort of what's coming about that. So this is uh, the final page here. It's uh, I want to thank you for watching this if you have and I want to point out that these are all websites that have some value. Our website, performancethinking.com, is, you know, that's our basic website. There's some stuff we have to clean up that's a little out of date, but it's got the information about our programs. It's got a blog. It's got a bunch of publications that you can register for the webinar through it. The YouTube channel that you perhaps know about has more and more stuff. Our LinkedIn group is often just seems like a place we put up ads, but there's very often, if you've ever got a question, if you raise it there, there's a lot of smart people who who are part of that group, and uh, you might find that interesting. And then finally, in Facebook, for those of you in the Applied Behavior Analysis or Behavioral Health World, um, we have a, a group, and you can join that, or a page, actually, and you can check that. So that's the webinar for today. I appreciate um, your watching it, and I think we're done for now.